as the the random card I picked just to introduce this round happened to be Spock's brain. But I always like how Shatner held the the communicator, right? He was he had it kind of halfway closed, and what, he was doing something. He had the finger action going on here. I mean, he was really working the prop. So that's uh, the you know, points on that. He he knew how to work the communicator. So that. That always was helpful. Voice command. No, I don't want voice command. I wanted Uhura to talk to me on my phone. No? Voice command. Well, I, I tried. Maybe in another episode we'll do um, something with, with my Bluetooth communicator. All right, Spock's brain. I think we're... Uh, can we learn about Spock's brain? I, I go back to Spock's brain... Uh, quite a bit more than I expect to. I like the feel of the show. I know it's an insane concept, and that's just a given. I mean, these folks are in space with gravity. So, so uh, you know, let's just push, shove that aside. You, suspension of disbelief, you just need to make the best judgment as, as we go along. Uh, but this is the episode where you had a sh uh, Kirk slash Shatner walk around the bridge in front of the view screen, and they had a rear projection on the blue uh, on the blue screen on the uh, <laughs> they had rear five four three two rear projection on the view screen. I thought that was kind of cool because then you could walk back and forth, and it took him to season three to to, to figure that out. Um, but um, and points on the sideburns here too were. No, I'm good. Go away. Don't don't talk to me. Points on the the sideburns on this episode too. We're getting to the the shaggy end of the of the '60s here, as reflected in Trek. Um, all right. Yeah, it's Box Brain. I think it's a fun episode. It's it's uh, the the givers of pain and delay. Yeah, it's okay. Now that I run run some of it through through the analysis bank up here. Um, it, 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 it has some some structural systemic flaws. <laughs> uh, what do we learn here? We have to say it's female intruder. Okay. Um, again, Enterprise with TM always makes me smile. Reawaken only to discover that she has surgically removed Spock's brain. We only have 24 hours to keep the body alive. Um, Neolithic Age, the eye morgues, and the... Uh, yeah, I'm not going to read out loud. You can just read it as you go uh, to teach. But it is a fun episode, okay? Now, I gotta. I should probably reread Cushman, look at the ins and outs of how this, you know, what the, what the initial idea was behind the episode, and how that didn't quite translate well into the execution. But hey... It's not lost in space. It, you know, it, it tried to keep it as real as it could. Um, I mean, again, this episode has some fine D. Kelly acting going on, especially when he loses the capacity to to do to put the brain back into Spock. Um, his brain is some fine DeForest Kelly moments in the Spock's brain. I think we should embrace the ridiculousness of the episode. It, it's it, it, it's it's what makes it a TV show and, and, and kind of fun. So there we go. Back from 1991, learning about Spock's brain. What card should I pick today? This is what I picked. It's Shatner in a in a pose. It looks like a first season. This this is a first season look for for Shatner. I wish I could uh, identify the episode. I feel bad that I can't. Ooh, wait a minute. That's not the Tantalus field behind me because that's season two anyway. But something about whatever is behind him. Look at even the noir effect. So we're not on the Enterprise because those are. These are some 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 blinds here. So it, we're we're in an office. So I'm guessing this is a Starbase episode. So it could be. Ah, that hair looks too good for court martial. 
uh, uh, what can I say? I think it's either going to be Court Martial or The Menagerie. Both episodes where they go to the Starbase. Uh, those episodes were filmed very close to one another too, so they could save the money on the, the Starbase set they already had. That's, that's my feeling. There's no way to know one way or the other um, immediately, but that's the impression I get. All right, so these are tricky uh, answers on the same card question, so we're gonna get we're gonna bring Spock's brain back into it. Um, so this will guide us through whatever the warp four questions are for this 1992 game. Oh, I went on eBay and looked at some of these 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 games again, looking for more Trek trivia cards. I think I have them all. I gotta get into books if I want more, but I, I have hundreds of cards, so I think I'm good. Uh, so I bought the sets on eBay years ago, um, and I guess some of them were supposed to have nice little game pieces. My sets didn't have those. That's why I, I got them as cheap as I did. I don't really know what the point of that story was, but I still have some boxes downstairs. Oh, ouch. The computer classification that Spock held, enabling him to... N now, this is from Court Martial. Am I right? Are these going to be Court Martial-centric questions? Did I get the photo correct? I'm so happy. Uh, I'm not going to give myself that much credit. Uh, because I don't know what computer classification he has. I know that this, this did come up... Um... Oh, I'm totally wrong. I was thinking Court Martial because when he gets on the stand... He needed the, the computer classification to give him credibility to talk about what was wrong with the computer. I guess that didn't happen. So we're on ultimate computer. Never mind. Let's just backtrack and get on with our day. How am I going to navigate this without seeing the answer? Ah. All right. What computer classification did Spock hold, enabling him to know about the M5 computer and the ultimate computer? I don't know. I kind of... I, I kind of saw that there was a four in there um i, I no so i can't I, I feel it wouldn't be right to even guess because now the four is in my head is it a, a 4g6 oh there's no four at all i was reading for an a7 computer expert classification so that is uh that was spock's uh computer classification in the ultimate computer which is funny because right here is Ultimate Computer, right? Well, that, that's why they call it the Ultimate Computer. That's the whole point of that episode. Um, this is an episode in which engrams are introduced into the track world. Engrams are a concept developed by L. Ron Hubbard in, in Dianetics. But fine science fiction writer, well, let me backtrack, a science fiction writer in his own right. Um, so engrams make their way. Engrams show up again with data. Uh, some, you know, some of his engrams were taken away in um, uh, insurrection. And then the phrase comes up once in a great while in, in all attractum. And I think it, this this is where you you heard it first. Uh, ultimate computer. <sighs> okay. This is where we first see uh, Richard Daystrom of the famous Daystrom Institute that we see in Next Gen, uh, which gets to uh, an irritating continuity or just someone not knowing what they're talking about error in that Star Trek Beyond the Pale movie, uh, Beyond Star Trek Beyond. That, that's, that was the second 2009 movie where uh, we go to the Daystrom Institute Daystrom is still alive in the... Right. Uh, question number two is about Charlie X. How many people does Kirk say are aboard the... Well, now I want to know what the name of the ship was in Charlie X. It's a small little ship. Was I feel like it should be called the Orion or something. I don't, I don't believe that's right. Charlie X It's also a very difficult episode to get through. It's annoying. It, this is one when I when I hear show up in my iPod, I'm like, why can't I delete this? Because I I, I, I don't wanna don't wanna listen to Charlie X. Charlie X, not the not my favorite. I'm gonna need two cards for this. Here we're gonna take this card from uh, Errand of Mercy, in his Organian finest, and see if we can't somehow finagle 
the question. Yeah. Well, it's 428, and we don't even get the name of the ship. Oh, that's the Enterprise. Oh, well, that's what happens when the questions on these cards are written like this. It's annoying, to say the least. So, by the first season, they're establishing 428. Now, this is different from what Pike says in, in the cage. It's 230, maybe, or around that area. It's not a... It's not a doesn't end in zero I think it's like 232 lives or it's in the 230 range if you hadn't caught that I could be wrong it could be 50 but I think it's 200 so somehow the same ship doubles its complement how they did that well um, this isn't real in the first place so I'm not even going to engage that that issue we get I gotta, gotta ground myself um, all right so all right, uh, I'm not doing, screw you card. Approximately what was the size of Nomad indicated in the episode, The Changeling? So Nomad is the precursor to, uh, a lot of people compare it, most people, those who care, uh, compare it to the Voyager probe and TNG, and yes, there's a little bit of similarities. Plenty of probes out there can, can infuse themselves with another life form and go nuts. You know, it's it, 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 have at it. So the what was the size? I don't know. I don't know what the size was. What did the answer say? Like was it? I don't remember. That's the good news about not remembering what I just see. So it was five hundred kilograms, a fraction over one meter in length. All right, that's how they could. I think they did that so they could get it in the transporter because that's pretty essential in an episode to get the, the little clamps on the Nomad as it's going crazy. Get it in the transporter, um, you know, which still doesn't make a... Well, yeah, it had to blow itself up, so you needed to beam it off as opposed to putting it in an airlock. But the fact that this little 500-kilogram, uh, one-meter-in-length little satellite could destroy whole solar systems is... Um, that's a leap. Watching the changeling, that's, that's more suspension of disbelief than Spock's brain. Right, especially what they do to Uhura, where she she lost all her memory, and at the end she's she's learning baby talk, and soon she'll be a communications officer again. It, it it's a that's a tough episode to to do a leap over. It's not one of the finest in a, in TOS, and a lot of flaws uh, looking at TOS from where we are today. But this one's just kind of kind of not not thought out, which is a shame. So that's Nomad. Okay, what answers will be revealed now? All Our Yesterdays, that's with Marriott Hartley, uh, Mr. Atos, uh, Spock goes back in time to the Stone Age on this planet, Spock and McCoy both go through the portal at the same time, Kirk ends up in some kind of... Um, 17th century version of this this planet it's uh, and you know hilarity ensues uh but um the most important part about all our yesterdays is what they did in the trek novel verse they had um ac crispin the late great uh wrote uh, yesterday's sun and This is the best part of all our yesterdays right here. We got two great Trek novels that I should... I'm putting, I'm putting these back on my to-read stack because I haven't read them since I was a wee lass. So this is from 83 and, and the sequel comes in 88. So, um, although you wouldn't know it in the episode, um, Spock had a, a, some, a, a, a conjugal visit with, um, with Marriott Hartley on this planet and um, it... it resulted in a, a son. Uh, what was the son's name? Well, there he is in his glory, in his very Frank Frazetta-like glory here. I think his name was Zahn Zar. Z-A-R. -Z Zar. Okay, I wasn't too far off. So Zar, like, is a, is a big badass on this planet, and it's Stone Age, so he, he, he becomes like a Conan, right? And in uh, and, uh, and this short, short read... 
uh, we, we learn about Tsar, and I think we, we meet him as, as a youth, and the, uh, the book was so successful that it, it spawned a sequel, which uh, a little bit longer, and the only, this is what I loved about those, those early, uh, well, not quite early, but 80s Trek books, they, they had this kind of embossed title, so you always knew that was the first edition, but that's my little geek out right there. Um, yeah, now I'm going to read these again. So this one set, uh, this, is, this one was set in the original TOS uh, five-year mission timeline. Uh, this one is in the, is in the movie, movie world. Um, and all I can remember about this is uh, 88. Again, this is something I'm getting. All this is becoming like, hey, this is my 12-year-old self back in like 1988 talking about Star Trek. So this is like Gen Xer explores Trek. Um, my, my takeaway from this, I, re I remember where I was. And uh, if the, it, how do I explain this? When I look at a lot of the, all the books, a lot of the books I've read in the course of my life, a lot of my takeaway is I remember where I was when I was reading this. And a lot of it involves being in a car in the back seat while my folks are driving somewhere. Um, so I have a, a memory of, of coming back home from visiting the, the grandparents in the, in the city and, and reading the end of this, which gets kind of out there from what I recall. Um, yeah, it's worth another read. So that's a time for yesterday. Go check it out. Uh, but first, read Yesterday's Sun. And before you do that, maybe go and, uh, and watch uh, all our yesterdays. That's, uh, that's the lesson we've learned today. Oh, we didn't even forget about the question. The sun is the Beta Niobe, and I might have had a better chance at trying to get that out of the ether had I not seen it because of um, the individuals that designed these cards that assume that there would be more than one person attempting to enjoy the trivia. And that is not always the case. What happened? Well, I don't know. Maybe we should stop with the... <laughs> what happened to M1 through M4? Okay, so I, I caught a little bit. I certainly don't remember what any of that said. Uh, so when M5 was going nuts, I think that's when, well, maybe Spock asks, Spock asks the question, maybe, or McCoy. Spock or McCoy asks what's going on with M1 through M4. And uh, I don't think they were stable enough. And the, the whole flaw in the, the M5 computer is it was based on Daystrom's engrams. And Daystrom wasn't all there. Had, had some issues. Oh, is that it? That's the only... Oh, fine. All right. Oh, okay. That's not an answer to this question, but all right. Not entirely successful. Okay, last question on this that seems to be a, a mix mash. Mix, mix mash. M -A, uh, between a couple ultimate computers. And they, they, we really don't see a lot of logic to these, uh, to these questions, do we? Uh, back to Charlie X. Where is the Enterprise supposed, supposed, you read it, you say it, to go to, oh, to take uh, Charlie Evans. Okay, like Starbase, it could it be like Starbase 12? Starbase 11, well, Starbase 11 was from Court Martial. I'm pretty, pretty solid on that. Starbase 12. Watch it, it'll be like Starbase 8. Or maybe it's a colony. Maybe it's like we gotta take him to the, uh, the beta colony or, or something like that. But let's just say Starbase 12. Although... Wow. Uh, kinda off. Colony Alpha 5. Doesn't have quite the ring to it as City Alpha 5. This is Colony Alpha 5. Colony Alpha 6 exploded. And even the clock wants me to quit now. All right, these are going to be tough cards to navigate given the lack of any space to, to separate the question from the answer. Um, this vexes me. 
I, I'm terribly vexed. All right, so our takeaways today, go, go read some classic A.C. Crispin books. They're well worth the time. This is going back on my stack. This is a real quick read. I read this quickly as like a, a 12 year old, I'm sure. I remember, okay, here's where I was when I read this. I was uh, in Florida in 1989, summer of 89. That's the summer of Star Trek V is really the summer of Batman. I was stuck down there. My folks gave me some money, some spending money to enjoy in Florida because I was going with, with some other folks. Um, and as soon as we got to a bookstore, even before we were we hit Florida, because I'm from Illinois and we just did the Illinois-Florida trip in, in the car. But the, the first mall we went to on a pit stop, I went straight into the B. Dalton and bought like a boatload of Star Trek books. And this is, um, and I, you know, I traded a lot of those for store credit at my local comic shop. But this one I kept. This is an original one that I had. Um, so I was, I was in Daytona Beach reading this. Because that's how I would enjoy a vacation in Florida. Buy a lot of Star Trek books. Stay inside and read them. My, uh, my habits haven't changed much. Uh, since then and I apologize to no one especially myself because <laughs> I freaking love this and and that's 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 who I am all right that's 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 a bit of my happy place today oh I turned this off maybe next time and uh, thank you for still being here tell your friends uh, sub subscribe over there um, I'd like to see, maybe I can get into the double digits sometime and, and, and folks can, can, can say something to me. Like, hi. I don't see anybody else doing trivia like this on the YouTubes. So that's my niche. Niche. Nietzsche niche. Okay, um, you need to know when to say when, Dave. Um, all right. Uh, I'm going to go have my day. And, and, and you go and you have yours.